afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Conversations at Noon. My name is Mariana Garcia. I'm a museum educator at Connecticut, the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut Salt State House, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's program, The History of Connecticut Food, Our Delicious Origins. With the holiday season well underway and New Year's just around the corner, it's the perfect moment to remember some of the traditional dishes that make New England and particularly Connecticut cuisine so unique and special. After such an eventful year, it is also a great time to learn about the stories behind some of our favorite recipes and ingredients. You'll be amazed at how much history there can be contained in a single slice of chocolate cake. Joining us today to tell us all about the Connecticut kitchen are Professors Amy Naraki and Dr. And Eric D. Lehman, sorry, authors of A History of Connecticut Food, a proud tradition of puddings, clam cakes, and steamed cheeseburgers. Amy Naraki and Eric D. Lehman teach creative writing and literature at the University of Bridgeport and are the authors of numerous books, including co-authoring A History of Connecticut Food, Literary, Literary Connecticut, and A History of Connecticut Wine. Eric Lehman's 19 books also include New England Nature, New England at 400, The Quotable New Englander, and Becoming Tom Thumb, which won the annual award for the Victorian Society of America and was chosen as one of the American Literary a Library Association's Outstanding University Press Books of the Year. His novella, Shadows of Paris, was the novella of the year for the Next Gen Indie Book Awards, Silver Medal for Romance from Forward Review, and a finalist for the Connecticut Book Award. Amy Naraki's six collections of poetry include Four Blue Eggs, Reconnaissance, and Mouth Brooders, which was a finalist for the Connecticut Book Award. Her memoir, a Comet's Tale won the 2018 Mind, Body, Spirit Award by Living Now Books by Living Now Book Awards. They live together in Hamden, Connecticut, with their two cats. Welcome, Eric and Amy. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, before we begin, I would encourage everybody to please enter any questions you have during the program in the comment section, and we'll get to those at the end of the talk. And uh, also, uh, if you can spare a minute at the end of the program, uh, we'll re we will really appreciate if you could fill out the survey, which you can find linked at the end of the video description. Um, we would love to hear your feedback. So uh, without further ado, Amy, Erica, take it away. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for inviting us. And we're very happy to be here and to talk to you about the history of Connecticut food. Um, you can start the slideshow, Mariana. OK. There we go. Great. So we're going to start talking a little bit about how I came to love my home state's food. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut. Eric, my husband, uh, grew up in Pennsylvania. And one thing that really influenced my perception of my home was meeting him, someone who wasn't native to Connecticut. And his method of learning about his new state was by traveling around. So when we got to do that together, it actually enlightened me a lot about the home that I had was rediscovering. I had moved back after college and grad school, but it was it was actually insightful for me to to see Connecticut through his eyes, and to think about it with new eyes coming coming to to the the food and the history of the food as as someone who grew up here and didn't really pay attention to it. Um, you can go to the next slide. Traveling around the next slide. There we go. Uh, thank you. Traveling around really hit it really hit home for us what our state was all about and how diverse it was is and how much we have here that we should take advantage of and we we do. It really we love to communicate the idea that what's local is important. It's important to help us think about our home. It's important to help us think about ourselves and we like to also talk about why history is important. History connects us to this land. When we learn about the history of the dishes and the crops and the people who grow and help us help us enjoy it, it, it really helps to emphasize that idea. It helps us pay attention and it helps us understand the connection to the past and to the present. And go to the next step. And for me, it really helped me solidify this idea about home. I'm proud to call Kinetic my home. I'm proud to call Eric, my husband, in our home. And we love to share our ideas about home. And I hope that our talking about the history not only enlightens you about 
the history and where the origin of these dishes comes from and how to enjoy them and to make them yourselves, but also to really help solidify home for you. This is the holiday time when we're, we want to be with the ones we love and that hopefully is possible for all of us. And learning about the history can connect us to the past, to our own families and help us understand the present as well as prepare for the future. Next slide, please, Mariana. So when we talk about the history of Connecticut food, um, we're talking about a changing history, a, a history that has things that stay the same. But um, for example, uh, you know, in the 1700s, Connecticut was a pork state and we everyone owned pigs. And in the 1800s, it was a sheep state. And then in the 20th century, it was a chicken state. So these things change over time. Um, the dishes that people eat change over time. Um, we're gonna get into a few of those and, and show how something like, um, uh, we see squash soup here, um, uh, how that bec becomes a staple and then disappears. And then we have it one maybe once a year at Thanksgiving. Um, but it was something that people would have, you know, every week um, a couple hundred years ago. Um, so these things are, are are more changeable than we think, but it's wonderful to explore all the different uh, aspects of uh, of food throughout time. So uh, yeah, move to the next one, please, and let's look at a couple examples. Um, so the, the, uh, in the upper left hand corner here, you can see uh, a guy on a truck. Um, this is an early photograph, um, and he's got a cart of beets. <laughs> um, and today we again don't remember this, but Connecticut was a huge beet state. So um, in the late 1600s, people began bringing beets over, and throughout the 1700s, um, beets were probably, uh, other than corn, were one of the most uh, popular crops in Connecticut. Um, this led to certain dishes like uh, red flannel hash, which we'll get to later, um, and then beets disappears. Okay, um, then peaches become a huge thing in Connecticut in the 1800s. Um, and we're the second biggest peach producer after, uh, after uh, Georgia. So um, something like we have this guy fishing at the bottom here. He's probably trout fishing um, at one of the falls here in Connecticut. Uh, but uh, our, our own fish here, the blue fish in the sound and uh, shad, uh, in the Connecticut River. Um, those are things that, because they're available to people who are living here, um, they become the food that people eat. There was not a, a global trade the way there is today, although some of those early settlers, the richer ones, could bring in Madeira wine and, and things like that. Um, but they're going to, they're going to catch fish here and they're going to salt it and they're going to keep it in barrels. And, and maybe export it, um, but they're going to want to, uh, to eat it as well. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, there's an apple pie. Apples were one of the most uh, and longest running uh, crops in the state. Uh, the apples that the colonists found here were pretty terrible. And so they brought seeds though. And by the time the trees get big in the late 1600s, they're starting to eat apples and not just eat them, but drink <laughs> apple cider, which becomes the most popular drink for 300 years um, in Connecticut. Um, it, apple trees are all over the state until uh, until the late 1800s, early 1900s, when a uh, scale insect destroys 90% of them, and then we become much less of an apple state. Um, uh, believe it or not, Connecticut was also a big lobster state. Um, today, we think of Maine as the lobster uh, capital. But Long Island Sound in the early years was perfectly uh, suited for lobster. And the colonists found like three feet foot lobsters and things like that, they claimed. Um, and so uh, it, lobstering for a couple hundred years was fine. In the 1800s, after the Little Ice Age ends, the waters start to get warmer. And by the 20th century, Long Island Sound is no longer a great place for lobsters. And instead, it's, uh, it's Maine. Um, that becomes the lobster state. 
All right, uh, move to the next slide, please. So let's look at an example of not just the crops and the food that was available here, but uh, a recipe that went in, came into style and, and out of style, and that's Hartford election cake, sometimes also known as Connecticut election cake. And this, uh, this was uh, uh, instituted by the fact that Connecticut uh, was had their own elections, right? We elected not only our representatives, but our own governor uh, back in colonial times. And so by the early 1800s, at least, if not before, they are eating uh, election cake. And that's because everybody would come to Hartford or sometimes New Haven, they would switch off in those years as the capital. And they would come to Hartford and they would uh, gather and, and there weren't enough hotels for these people. Uh, you know, they, all the electors from all over the state are coming to uh, the same way the electoral college gets together to get today. Um, and so these, the housewives or whoever's making the food would make these giant cakes and they were um this you can see a picture here this is with golden raisins but they were much we would eat it and we'd be like oh this is raisin bread um and then but then they would usually frost it as well we don't have it frosted here in this picture so you would have a frosted election cake so you'd go there'd be a uh, election uh they'd all put their votes in and then they'd celebrate uh this uh unique right um you know granted by our charter and our, our state constitution um through this election kick and if you look at the first recipe books in america you find uh this hartford election cake um, and it becomes this sort of staple recipe that's attached to the tradition of dem democracy next slide, next slide. So just like something like Harvard election cake features a recipe that has importance to our history. Um, the crop of corn is really important as well. And we like to talk about it for, for that reason, as well as a number of others. Of course, corn is native to this America. So it was, has been grown here for, for millennia. And the native tribes that Connecticut colonists or New England colonists, England, British colonists came and encountered new about corn and they were growing it and had been growing it and cultivating it for for quite a while. Um, but corn is a great crop to talk about because not only that idea of colonists coming and discovering it, but it showcases the idea that the perception of a dish or a crop or a meal changes over time. We also see that corn itself has changed over time. So the, the actual crop has changed through um, through cultivation over over time. And the dishes associated with it change as well. And they continue to change and evolve. So it's a great way to, to kind of put a lot into just one, one, one crop, and that's corn. Um, we see here different things that you can make with corn cornmeal. Um, and the corn itself is often how we think of it today, but we have to imagine back to when colonists first came and their perceptions of it. They didn't know what, what it really was and had no experience with it. So we had to learn, uh, colonists had to learn from native tribes about corn. And to a great extent that influenced how corn was perceived. Um, it wasn't something that they liked. It was, even though they understood the idea of grinding it and making it into cornmeal as the native tribes had shown them, um, it wasn't something they liked to eat, it wasn't palpable. And there was also a perception that it was savage food and therefore not desirable. That changed though, um, as, as when uh, crops like wheat were tried in Connecticut soil and didn't really do that well, uh, the option then turned to corn and cornmeal and growing it. So it became more popular over time and dishes began to evolve made from the cornmeal. Um, it, um, such as, you know, pancakes, what we call pancakes now, or journey cakes, and then different breads um, became options as well. We also learned about how the uh, growing the corn with peas and beans and squash allowed for a better soil, and um, that uh, in turn changed the composition of corn as well as the what, what we would do with it. Um, we find that uh, writers like Joel Barlow and even Harriet Beecher Stowe become nostalgic for their Indian pudding and their what what uh, Joel Barlow famously called hasty pudding. Um, 
And so it became something that they wanted to eat and liked to eat and develop dishes, especially Indian pudding for that, for that reason. As we go to the next slide though, we also understand that, that, that other changes are influencing how we uh, the colonists and, and future generations would enjoy cornmeal and corn, corn uh, dishes. So uh, Joel Barlow, whom I mentioned, wrote about hasty pudding. And the hasty part doesn't have a lot to do with the fact that you can make it quickly. Uh, corn meal is, takes time and a lot of time to you know, moisten and get soft so that you can make it into, well, pudding, uh, what we would call today a cake. Um, it also showcases how our tastes evolved. So once we got better um, access to sugars and sweeteners, uh, the, the dish itself would evolve from something that you might have at breakfast or maybe as an accompaniment to a meal at dinner time. And eventually it becomes a dessert. So we see that it showcases First, it's not very well liked by colonists, then it becomes something that's very well liked, then it loses popularity as other, other grains can be grown and imported, and it gains popularity as uh, something that's nostalgic and something that reminds travelers from far away, like Joel Barlow, of their home. Uh, and now, now it, it's kind of disappeared too, at least something like Indian pudding has. That particular dish has, has evolved into different different ways of um, using cornmeal, and we have other options for, for grains. Um, but Indian pudding now is also something that reminds us of the nostalgia of history. And it, um, and we will probably find this only at a, an inn or a diner where um, you know it's a cl classic. Um, maybe you'll make it for Thanksgiving or for next year's Thanksgiving or this year's Christmas. Uh, but further, if you go to the next slide, we also see that corn has evolved into new flavors and evolving flavors as new immigrants came in the 20th, 20th century and brought their dishes uh, from South America and Central America. We have here um, the a rapis, which is cornmeal uh, made into a patty, which you fill with a uh, pair with rice and beans and pork. Uh, you can get this at a food truck or at a restaurant. And the other version of the rapis is kind of like a like a, um, a pita where you would fill it with the meat. And these are influenced by by immigrants who have made Connecticut their home and brought their dishes with us. And they now, and now actually become staples for our plates too. And we seek these out in our restaurants as well as try to make them at home uh, to showcase the, the history of cornmeal and corn. And of course, we all now love to go to our farmer's market and pick up the sweet corn that is that has changed too from what the colonists would have encountered. Great, next slide, thank you. Um, so let's look at a couple ways that uh, local specialties become local specialties. Um, clams are something that uh, were widely available from the earliest years uh, in Connecticut uh, when the first European uh, ships came down Long Island Sound, they described the Connecticut coast as having all these little pyramidal hills. <laughs> and when, of course, they got closer, they found out these were not hills of stone or dirt. They were hills of clamshells. <laughs> um, they were there from the Native Americans who had spent the summers on the beach and, you know, ate the clams and tossed them in these giant piles, which had accumulated over years. And there was one in Milford uh, that was supposedly over 100 feet high. So uh, clams were available, therefore they get changed into different dishes. Here we see uh, clam fritters um, at the top and clam hash. You've got a lot of one particular uh, meat, in this case, in your fridge or in your you know pickle barrel or whatever you're keeping your stuff in throughout the centuries. Um, well, you're gonna have to find different ways of presenting it and to getting it to your family and to your uh, whoever's coming to your house. Um, next slide, please. So uh, here are two uh, Connecticut specialties. Um, one is clear broth chowder. Um, you might have had clear broth chowder in Rhode Island um, and think of it as Rhode Island clam chowder, but in fact, uh, if you go back to all the uh, recipe books in the 1800s, you will find Connecticut clear broth chowder. Um, 
it is thickened by the potatoes in it rather than by putting milk in it, uh, like the Boston version. Um, usually has some uh, salt pork or we would put bacon in there um, and the clams, just like regular clam chowder. Um, it was developed on the coast, uh, sort of southeast coast of Connecticut and uh, then moved to Rhode Island, in fact. And then the Rhode Islanders are much better at uh, <laughs> at uh, promoting their their uh, their food than we are. Um, we've been lax about that, certainly in the 20th century. And so this sort of died out in Connecticut, although you can still find hyper-local versions of it. Um, there's like a Westbrook clam chowder and there's one, there's a store in Brantford that runs it and everyone goes there. Um, what is that, Bud's Fish Market. Um, and so it, it's, it's left over in these tiny little um, uh, uh, enclaves. Um, uh, roasted barbecue clams is another uh, example of that. Uh, we find uh, clam roasts uh, on fires uh, pretty commonly throughout the 1800s. Today, I'm not sure if uh, the people at the place uh, in uh, Guilford there invented this on their own or if it's a remnant uh, of some of the uh, roasting uh, clams with sort of uh, barbecue sauce. Um, the one they do there is super authentic and um, I, you know, when I first had it, when I first came to Connecticut, I was like, oh, this has got to be something from like New Orleans or something that um, some, you know, sort of immigrant came th from Louisiana and started. But no, it, it, it was started right here uh, in Connecticut. It was probably started in other places as well. But you see how these hyper local specialties become Connecticut specialties or they, in the case of clear broth chowder, fade from from history um, as time goes on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we also have in Connecticut, obviously not just specialties that are that are hyper local, but in fact, uh, are regional specialties that were known uh, throughout New England. Um, donuts, obviously, we think of as a New England, uh, you know, dish today. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe talked about them in her memoirs um, and making the donuts, and it was it was a something to do on a on a winter morning um and and describe the the awesomeness of of eating those donuts um i think this one is from uh wallingford right uh Niels, Niels. i think this is a Niels. it's on a fancy dish there just to give you guys <laughs> 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 it was a fancy uh, you know it takes a long time to make a donut uh, in the old days, and so this was a specialty. Um, something like uh, in the lower left, there is uh, grape nuts pudding, um, which uh, was occasioned by the fact that people didn't know what to do with this cereal, grape nuts, um, and they decided to mix, put it on a top of a custard and bake it, and it turned out that it worked really well. And this became a diner specialty um, throughout the 20th century. Um, and then uh, today has somewhat faded from those menus again, but it was a regional, especially it wasn't just in Connecticut, it was throughout uh, the Northeast here. Um, uh, shad was not just a Connecticut fish. Uh, it was very prominently uh, featured in the Connecticut River and was used, uh, in fact, uh, George Washington's troops at Valley Forge were saved by getting barrels of uh, salted shad from our governor, Jonathan Trumbull. Um, yeah, there's some letter from Washington. He's like, thanks for the shad, you know. Um, but, uh, the, you know, that, that same fish was also in New Jersey and uh, other areas uh, in the Northeast here. Um, shad roe became one of these regional specialties. Um, here you can see it on our sort of in, indoor grill wrapped in bacon. That's the eggs of the shad. Um, wrapped in this, you can also make that into sort of scrambled eggs. There's different ways of eating it. Um, that was the one dish that we tried out of all the dishes. Uh, there's 70 recipes in our book, and we must have tried several hundred. Uh, that was the only one I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get myself to really love. Um, it was good, but it wasn't great. Um, so. Uh, so regional specialties, and let's look at one in particular on the next slide. This is red flannel hash. So 
I, I mentioned before that Connecticut had been a beet state. Um, we had had a lot of beets. And so even in the 1700s, you find people making uh, a hash from the beets um, and noticing that, in fact, the beets colored everything in the hash red. And so they would uh, have leftover vegetables, um, whatever meat they had, corn, beef, uh, but they might have had pork in the 1700s, whatever they had left over, and they would fry it up in a hash that would turn red from the beets. Um, this then later became a, uh, a restaurant dish and a, in particular a diner dish here in New England um, and known as red flannel hash uh, because of the sort of flannel look of it um, with corned beef, potatoes, uh, which they wouldn't have been eating in the early 1700s. Um, that was added later. They die up really nice and become red and then and and the, and the beets and onions so uh so red flannel hash is an example of a regional specialty that was eaten a lot here in connecticut but in fact is not just native to connecticut moving right along to the next slide so that brings us to another uh connecticut specialty and uh an example of something that's that's not even hyper regional i mean very very concentrated in in Connecticut, first of all, and really the central part of Connecticut, and that's the steamed cheeseburgers. Um, hamburgers are not unique to Connecticut, nor really to America, but uh, we certainly have throughout the, the nation taken taken the hamburger as our own, and that's certainly true of Connecticut. We have good claims to um, some really great hamburgers, but the steamed cheeseburgers we found were are, are completely original to uh, Connecticut. And it's really exactly as the, the name suggests, it's uh, meat is steamed rather than grilled or flame broiled. Um, and so how did this come to be as not only something that was done in Connecticut for we think the first time, but it has grown actually, and but stayed regional, um, very, very regional, very, very close to home, which I think is a good thing. Although, um, you know, maybe, maybe it'll migrate uh, past our borders. Uh, we we discovered that it, it's not exactly we're not exactly sure when it started, but sometime in the 1920s, um, and then eventually became uh, made by someone named Jack O'Rourke, I'm uh, sorry, John O'Rourke, um, and he brought it to or started making it in O'Rourke's Diner, uh, which is still still around today, and you can find it and you can order it there and that's where we learned a little bit more about it you can also see uh by so in the 1940s it began there and by the 50s 1959 around there uh places like ted's in meriden were making it too and since then it really it really is stuck to the you know middletown meriden we find examples uh now in places like wallingford and, and around the state and other you know road food places but um we were interested in thinking about it as a Connecticut specialty, a, a central Connecticut specialty. But we were also interested in learning about the process and learning about how much understanding how something is made help, uh, helps us both enjoy and love it and, and share it and recommend it to, to others. So that's what we intended to do. We went to uh, O'Rourke's to sample it for ourselves. And we talked to Brian O'Rourke, who is the nephew of the uh, John O'Rourke, who brought it to Middletown. And he showed us what they do in, in the restaurant. And it, one of the things that makes it kind of important to keep it as a restaurant food is the process. Um, you steam the meat separately, and the cheese is a bonus, in my, my opinion. Um, but steaming it means you have you know separate compartments. And you can buy an industrial uh, steamer, such as you would have at a restaurant. It's pretty pricey. So that really wasn't helpful for us to be um, able to understand the process and do it ourselves, which we wanted to do, because that helps us learn. In the next slide, we'll see how we modified the restaurant version at, at our home. Um, again, we first learned about the process and how steaming the meat in a separate compartment and then steaming the, the cheese makes it lovely and gooey and just great to put on anything and it works very well with the with the cheeseburger or the burger uh, to become a cheeseburger. Um, we also learned about the, you know, the, the, the bun is important too because it has to hold up to the meat, which is gonna be really, really juicy. And of course the cheese, which is gonna be um, just delicious. In the next slide, 
you'll see what we did to do it at home. Uh, learning about the process is important to figuring out how we can do it at home. We have an aluminum steamer, uh, three-tiered, which we found very helpful because you can then, like you would do at a restaurant, steam each um, each level in a different with your different items. We put ground beef, uh, recommended by Brian O'Rourke at O'Rourke's Diner. Very, very good um, ground, ground beef. Um, and then he also recommended, which is what we tried, very sharp aged cheddar. Shred the cheddar into the compartment and then put your meat in the, we used bread pans, which was convenient. They were small enough and they fit in the steamer. Steam the cheese for about 20 minutes and the three tiers made it easy to do separately so we can get the cheese going a little longer and then put the meat in. And so we, we were surprised that we could get it to work. Um, you can buy an industrial um, small, kind of like a um, toaster oven size for the home. They do sell them. They're pretty easy to find online. And of course, you can go to the restaurants and get it prepared for you. Uh, but I, part of our understanding of the history was learning the process. And so we were, we were excited that we could, we could do it with something, uh, which is really, really a restaurant food, which is the steamed cheeseburger. And then put it all together on the plate, and the next slide will show you show you the delicious results. Um, it's not something we do a lot, just because it, it does take some time and some process. But it's um, it's it, it was insightful in the way that the meat really the flavor really does come out of the meat when you steam it. Um, and I'm all about cheese, so I I, I love that. So Excellent. these kind of. Um, uh, road food or fast food places. Um, Stephen Vincent Benet, who is buried here in Connecticut, called them quick lunch, mm -hmm. um, the quick lunch rooms. Um, this is this is one of the places other than the kitchens where great dishes uh, begin. So let's look at the next slide. Um, and this is uh, a Connecticut specialty that was developed uh, by a fish market guy, uh, Harry Perry, uh, on the post road in Milford um, in the 1930s. Uh, the, the other lobster roll, the sort of main lobster roll that has the mayonnaise and the cold salad kind of uh, version, that already existed by this point. Um, but Harry Perry and others like him were said, well, why would we eat lobster in a cold salad if we can eat it like we normally eat it, which is hot and with butter and lemon? And so put, putting it into a, this, this is a sub roll from Lobster Landing, but you can put it in a New England hot dog roll um, and, and putting the, the lobster meat in that became a local specialty. And then that is spread uh, from everywhere. We had some down in Key West a couple of years ago um, and, and, and other places. The main one is much easier for restaurants to do. Um, but uh, if you find the Connecticut hot lobster roll, um, you should always get it. Um, there are so many good ones here in Connecticut. And I'm glad that in recent years, they've started calling them Connecticut hot lobster rolls rather than just hot lobster rolls because it did it did develop here. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll see some other road food or or fast food. Um, uh, oh, this is the this is uh, uh, another fast food invention here in Connecticut. Of course, uh, Italian immigrants brought in, uh, a form of pizza into America. Um, Italy and New York are always arguing about who invented it. Um, the, uh, there were versions in Italy. It, it became what we think of as pizza today, probably in New York. Um, however, here in Connecticut, we had someone like Frank Pepe there at the bottom uh, who created their own style of this American specialty um, using a super hot coal-fired oven um, which creates, as you can see in the, the picture there on the right, um, a sort of awesome brown cheese on the top and crispy. And then the bottom, unlike a Brooklyn pizza, for example, which you can fold up and like sort of stuff in your mouth, um, the, the bottom of New Haven style is much firmer. Um, but then the inside, because it's super hot and quicker, the inside is chewy um, and delicious. And so uh, that becomes a, a New Haven style. He also uh, invents the white clam pizza because again, we have clams and we have plenty of clams. So let's put them on everything. Um, let's put them on pizza. And so we get that 
uh, version of the coal-fired New Haven style pizza as well. And, and at Sally's and there are now coal-fired, uh, that has gone beyond our borders now, not just in uh, Frank Pepe's uh, chain, but uh, in other chains and other places. Um, that has become uh, something. Well, I, we just had some really great one up in Torrington and Sasso's um, coal-fired pizza. So uh, moving right along to the next slide, we're gonna see a couple more, um, you know, quick lunch places. Uh, there's Louie's Lunch, uh, as Amy referred to before. Uh, they have a very good claim to inventing the hamburger, although hamburger meat and putting it between bread probably was around before that. Um, and we we can find it on menus uh, earlier in the 1800s, um, but really that was just hamburger meat on the plate, or sometimes um, there were different ways that people would eat it. Um, it's certainly the oldest hamburger joint in the nation. Um, 1895, uh, Wisconsin and Texas also both claimed to invent the hamburger, but their claims are not nearly as good as uh, Louis' lunch. Um, something like uh, hot dogs, again, not invented here, but um, the splitting the hot dog down the middle was something that may have been invented uh, in West Haven uh, this time. Um, so the guy there sort of split it and he was able to grill it faster and get it to people uh, who were um, coming through very quickly on the train. But he could order it and he could get it to them very quickly. Uh, we have lots of other great hot dog joints in the state today. Uh, Cappy dogs are, are famous there in Britain, or Blackies with the relish. Um, there's, we're really a, a hot dog. So we have the Hummel hot dogs here, of course. Um, the one in the lower right-hand corner is a more recent uh, uh, invention that I thought was amazing. And the, you can see the New England hot dog roll there. And they put a piece of buffalo, buffalo chicken in there with the, with the uh, blue cheese. And uh, I was like, why has nobody done this ever before? <laughs> and this is how things get started, right? Um, when somebody just comes up with an idea like that, uh, maybe that will die and go away, or maybe it will become a regional specialty in the next 30 or 40 years. In the upper right-hand corner there, you have an Italian sandwich from uh, Nardelli's. Um, uh, submarine sandwiches uh, were uh, invented here in Connecticut. I'm pretty confident about that. They, there, again, are other states like New Jersey who claim it, um, but uh, the sub base in uh, in Groton and in New London there that was known for submarines is in the 1916 that starts, and, and in the 1920s uh, we have Italian immigrants like Benedetto Capalbo who may have in, invented that there at his shop. Uh, again, the sandwich itself was similar to ones that were made in Italy, um, but it certainly then gets the name submarine sandwich uh, there in New London and becomes a, uh, a specialty um, and is taken to other places then afterwards. Uh, moving right along to the next slide, we can see that it's not just road food, that high-end places can, can do different things with food too. Um, in the lower left-hand corner there, uh, you can see uh, a high-end version of a Connecticut classic, which was uh, fried oysters. Uh, again, not only a Connecticut classic, there's fried oysters all around the world. But it was particularly known in Connecticut. And in fact, uh, there's a famous story about how when he was campaigning, Abraham Lincoln had his first fried oyster. He was from Illinois. They, didn't have oysters in Illinois back then. You can uh, ship those around. Um, you can pickle them, but he had fresh fried oysters in Bridgeport. He thought this was the greatest dish he's ever had. And he it became his favorite food while he was at the White House. And in fact, he served it uh, at his second inauguration. Um, that's a high-end version done by uh, a restaurant in Nor Match in Norwalk with uh, looks like beef tartare and truffle cream, I believe. Um, something in the upper right-hand corner, we have, uh, we're kind of a chocolate state, so you have high-end chocolates. Uh, one of the things Connecticut found they had to do um, in the 1800s, as soon as the Midwest opened up, you know, Connecticut couldn't be known as a pork state or anything anymore because they could do, you know, so many more out West. Um, they could, they could 
we couldn't compete. So they had to specialize and we specialized in different things, cheeses and different things like that. And chocolates was one of the things this is from fascists and Waterbury there. Delicious high end food. Um, in the middle, we have uh, some of the incredibly uh, in innovative stuff by Bun Lai at Mia's Sushi in New Haven. Um, he, he takes the sushi roll form and you can see one with cornmeal there and honey, goat cheese on the left with okra and Berber spices. Um, he's, he's using a form from Japan and he's taking it and in new directions and local directions. He makes, he uses local species and a fish for his, in his restaurant and local uh, invasive species, in fact, um, as well. Yeah, so you can see how innovation from from uh, that happens naturally, that happens from uh, chefs, that people are doing in their home kitchens. All this becomes what we think of as Connecticut food. All right, we can get to our final slide, and we're just going to share some concluding thoughts, and and um and then we'll be happy to get some questions from everybody. Um, so this is kind of how we put it all together not only in our books, but the way we think about Connecticut and the Connecticut table. At the Connecticut table, we gather and gaze out the window at diverse landscapes, the coastal water and its many creatures, which tempt our tastes, the farms, which show us the way towards the harvest bounty, old train tracks heading to city centers where chefs make us dinner. We celebrate our shared past, whether our families came here long ago or we are just passing through no matter how long we plan to stay. Our Connecticut cornucopia includes old favorites, Indian pudding and clam chowder, a new entrance, chicken arepas and spicy polenta. And those dishes we don't mark by time, but just consider part of home. Steamed cheeseburgers, pizza, macaroni and cheese. A lush pyramid of dishes from all corners of the world, from all our immigrant pasts. A little ritual, a pinch of celebration, a hearty spoonful of Thanksgiving. Mix and serve. We want to thank you so much for joining us, and we're happy to, to talk a little bit more. Or know, you know, share your favorites and share more of ours. Thanks, Mariana. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm starving. <laughs> I have a little. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Right. Anyway, I'm starving now. When you started talking about our repas, I was just starving. Yeah. <laughs> now, before we started, uh, we do have a couple of questions from uh, our viewers. Uh, anybody, if you do have any questions, please do post them on the comments so that we can uh, share them with our speakers here. Rebecca is asking. She's curious sure. if, if our speakers have a special special. You already spoke about making uh, steamed cheese uh, cheeseburgers at home, but do you have any other? Uh, we have a lot of these. Um, okay. Well, one that one that we showed on the screen early on was um, squash soup. I found that once we learned how to make that, that that's kind of a staple uh, that I like to go to. It's very easy. Um, you can do it with squash. You can do it with, um, you know, any kind of. You can even do it with potatoes. You know, I found, and that was really helpful for me as a you know, home chef to learn, once you learn some basic recipes and learning the ones that would have been basic to my ancestors, that was, that was insightful. So I would say a staple for us is the squash soup because it's, it's, uh, it's good for winter. It's, it's also good. We, you know, it's just the two of us and our cats. So, uh, we, we, we love leftovers and that, that's a good, a good hearty dish that'll last you for the week. So that's one of my go-tos. Clear broth clam chowder. I, I, I really enjoy making that. Um, just get the, the broth and then go for it. Um, you know, uh, we do a lot of the recipes in here with the apples and, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the others. I mean, something like uh, making your own lobster roll. You know, we've done that several times. I wouldn't call it a regular thing for us because it's more difficult to, to, to manage, right? So, so you know, for home chefs, you're not going to probably make a New Haven style pizza every week because, you know, and, and we don't have a coal fired oven. So, you know, what we can do is, is not quite as uh, amazing as what they do. But a lot of the older recipes are actually quite, we've translated them in our book to 
ways that you can make them at home. A lot of the breads we make, um, things like that, you know. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, it must have been so much fun to experiment with old recipes to come up with the uh, modern equivalent. It was also fun to look at the old recipes because the way the language of the recipes from you know the 1700s is much different. There's not a lot of precision, so you, you had there was some some guesswork in use, figuring out. Use an egg-sized piece of butter, <laughs> like you know. <laughs> or also translating something from it would have been made in great volume to something that you know we didn't need the volume. So that was interesting too as a process. Yeah, it's a science almost. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Kathy asks, uh, what is the most famous dish? From Connecticut? It changes over time. I mean, that's, that's what we found. And I think that right now it would be New Haven style pizza would be something people thought of. I mean, Pepe's and Sally's keep getting the top number one, number three. And, and in modern pizza and other ones, number 10 in the country, you know, when it comes to pizza. Um, so I would say right now that or Connecticut lobster roll, but that changed over time. In the 1700s, it might have been election cake. Um, so the, th that's one thing that definitely we, we have found. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you yeah the, I mean, the, the chowder kind of comes to mind, but but that's probably because the New England style clam chowder which is the, the, the creamy with milk, um, kind of goes into the forefront of your mind. So Campbell's kind of yeah wrecked um, that in the sense that they made it. We like to emphasize that the clear broth is a Connecticut, you know, early favorite as well as a famous favorite from from Connecticut. Um, and the lobster roll, we're really happy is is being featured a lot more. Um, so that's that's good news for Connecticut and good news for history of food for sure. Um, probably the most famous would be the pizza, I would say. Right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I also have some questions from our staff. Uh, and uh, one of them is, if you had to make a full meal with only Connecticut food, meaning appetizers, main course, drinks, desserts, uh, what would it be? Fried oysters for an appetizer, I would I say. I would agree with that, yeah. Um, we would probably do a, a duck or some kind of game. Um, we like duck a lot, and you know that was something that you would we would have found on Connecticut tables early on. Um, so that I would vote, vote for that for my main course. Yeah, I love duck, but you know, again, that's today not something people might think of as a Connecticut dish. Probably just um, to give the historical kind of context would be something like Indian pudding. Um, in, in an interesting way, you could probably do a whole, you know, like a day's meal just with Indian pudding or something related to corn or cornmeal. Um, that's a really good question, a whole meal. We have a couple of recipes for um, for cocktails in the, in our book, uh, History of Connecticut Food. So we might start off with a, um, um, probably something like the cider car that we've found from, I think it's, so one of the New Haven restaurants, I think it's Zinc. Um, but we might try something interesting like um, flip, which is made with um, ale and rum. rum. And it's called flip for reasons that a little hard to pinpoint, but it would have been made in a tavern. And one reason it might be called flip is because the tavern, the person making it would froth it up um, by going back and forth with a, with a big, um, Stein, right? Um, so we might try that just for you know fun, as maybe an appetizer drink. Um, I'd want grape nuts pudding for dessert. I think <laughs> Eric's a big fan of grape grape nuts pudding. I might try something with apples just to feature them as an important crop in Connecticut. There's so much you can do with apples. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Really, really a fascinating, um, fascinating way to think about featuring all recipes for one meal. That's great. Thank you. So I have an interesting question here. Uh, a lot of local dishes across the country have working class origins, such as lobster rolls in Maine, buffalo wings in Western New York, scrapple, like scrapple in Pennsylvania. Um, do they make cheap or less desirable food products into filling meals? Is this true for any Connecticut dishes? In a way, kind of many Connecticut dishes, I would say. I mean, certainly think about you know, even very early settlers in um, 
who who have to get by with what's available um, and don't have you know wealth by any means. So they have to not only get by with what's available, but make a lot of it for uh, you know a family and probably share it with neighbors. So I think um, you know what we think of working class kind of bring it back to the to the times where everybody's working um, and and farming and growing their own food and and then making that into um, the, the, for their family for the, cooking for their family and sharing it with their family. Um, you know, once wealth comes in, then you can import things and you can you can be more fancy. But I think I think really a lot of foods um, that that origin and, and recognizing it. And thank you for mentioning that is really important to remember. Um, when you have when you have less or when you have limitations, that's when you begin to get inventive, and that's where you wonder what would happen if I did this with this, and this is available, so I'm going to try that. Um, that's a really good insight, and I think I think that's important to keep in mind. And certainly, we see that as we go into the 20th century with hamburgers and hot dogs and and the lobster roll, as you mentioned, where um, you need, you're on a budget and you need it quick and you need it fast, you need it nourishing. So. Um, and the working classes throughout our, our history have been able to share their their insights about that with us. And that's a special. I mean, lobster rolls are expensive today, but lobster, as everyone knows, was a trash fish <laughs> for centuries um, and, and was not expensive at all. Um, nobody wanted to deal with getting into it, you know. Um, and so that was that the lobster roll was a working class food uh, when it was invented in the now and now it'll cost you twenty dollars for a for a lobster roll if you're lucky. Well, even the, like the chowder is invented, you know, along the shore because you're going to feed the fishermen, and you need a lot of it, and you need to it's something hearty. Yeah, for sure. It's a crazy, oh, crazy change. change. Uh, so we got a couple of more questions from our viewers. Uh, Kathy asks, "Where did you do your research?" Everywhere. <laughs> um, luckily, I was writing a guidebook to Connecticut at the time. And so we were traveling all over the state anyway for that and going to restaurants all over the state. And um, so th that research fed into this research. Um, and of course, we looked at, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred old recipe books um, from, you know, famous books like Amelia Simmons book to just the local recipe books uh, from different libraries around the state and women's clubs and things like that. Um, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we would we would go down to that um, New Haven Museum where they have archives of uh, Family Circle, Con Connecticut Circle magazines, yeah, magazines, which they had a lot of not only recipes, but um, reports from, you know, agricultural reports, which helped us gain insight into what crops were growing and things like that. Um, yeah, so uh, newspaper databases sure, you know, from sure. the 1800s were really useful, and that and that kind of fee fed into the the history as well as kind of opened up our ideas of finding more modern examples of what, what we could find. We talked to chefs, we talked to um, uh, farmers, you know, and 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 learned from them, but also shared a little bit with them as well. And we we did have kind of a home. Home, home kitchen going on. Um, we had help from our friends and family who would help us make the the, di the, the dishes. There were so many. Yeah, try. we did a lot of sampling. I gained about 15 pounds that year. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, must have been a crazy operation. Uh, Carol would like to know, was the infamous nutmeg a prominent spice used in Connecticut cuisine historically? Yeah, I'll field that one. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so the the trade with the Caribbean uh, happened pretty early, and even in the late 1600s, people were doing that quite often. Um, it's one of the things that brought Connecticut a lot of wealth at the end of the 1600s, early 1700s, and what caused the Puritans so much heartache and oh, we're we're becoming too worldly, you know. Um, so they brought back nutmegs, and so it was a real spice. However, um, we get it called the nutmeg state for maybe a little more sinister reason. And that's these Connecticut merchants uh, might just carve pieces of other wood to look like a nutmeg and sell them off to people um, and basically con them into buying very expensive spices, but it's not spice. It's just like carved from the old oak stump out back or whatever. And so people are like shaving, you know, 
bark into their into their uh, coffee or whatever, and they're like, "Hmm, this is very good. It tastes like oaky," you know. Um, so, uh, but in fact, uh, they were being conned. So that uh, the fact that we're in a nutmeg state um, says something not just about the trade that Connecticut was doing, but also about the uh, character of the sort of Connecticut the wily Connecticut merchants of the 1700s, yeah. Well, we did find that when we looked at the recipes that nutmeg would be featured. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and it we was were one of the getting real common, nutmegs. One of the more common um, spices that would be used. You know, and today we might use cinnamon more, but I think uh, nutmeg would have been definitely something that you would you would want, which made it profitable for somebody to con you into buying it. So sure, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the <laughs> Uh, so we have one question from Mike. Uh, was apple cider donut invented in Connecticut? I never heard that, uh, that it was invented here, but it was certainly very popular. Um, that'd be an interesting little project to, to see where the first mentions of that are. Um, although sometimes first mentions are not necessarily where things are invented, but uh, it was certainly popular here. We had the apple cider. We had a lot of it. Um, that's what uh, I mentioned this earlier, but Literally everybody drank a mildly alcoholic apple cider from the late 1600s into the, well into the 1800s. Um, children, <laughs> every meal, uh, because the water was bad, right? Um, you didn't want to drink water. So you had this cider, which had been fermented um, and it was only mildly alcoholic, but it was alcoholic and everybody was drinking it. And so they would use it for everything else too, like making uh, the donuts. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question that I wanted to ask. Uh, sure. What do you believe are the strongest international influences in modern Connecticut cuisine? Oh. Well, you mentioned the arepas. I think that's that, you know, South American and Central American influences are very, very strong. Um, and related to cornmeal, I'm gonna, you know, um, but I think just in our, re in our region, that would definitely be true. Certainly, go ahead. Did you I was just going to say that moving here from Pennsylvania 22 years ago, people in New England all, all still don't think that I'm from Connecticut because even though I've been here more than half my life. So um, I, uh, I noticed the immediate change uh, of there were a lot of Japanese restaurants here uh, as opposed to where I was in Pennsylvania where there were a lot of Chinese restaurants. Um, and so something like that, um, I would say, you know, yeah. sushi is so widely available here. I, I was shocked at that when I moved back here in, in the 90s. Um, yeah, Central and South America. But I mean, if you're talking about earlier than that, then Polish um, yeah. and Italian, yeah. obviously, were one of the most Italian states um, were the ones that uh, that would have been influential. Um, yeah, immigrants throughout have been, you know, and colonists are immigrants too, we remember that, um, have have brought their culture from their home countries. And that's, I mean, that's true of everywhere, but in Connecticut, we see that for sure. Um, yeah, Italian immigrants coming in the early 20th century, and fo not followed by, but simultaneously with Eastern European, Polish, um, yeah. and yeah, uh, so it's, it's, there's rich history, and I think that's really important to remember. And that's a good question for that. Um, yeah, we, 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 I mean, it's also the phenomenon of having kind of a global economy where you can get anything. Um, the best part about that is you can get it close by too. So we don't have to, you know, ship it in. We can actually find it close by because of the influence of, of centuries of immigrant experiences. Yeah, great. Right, well, thank you so much. All right. So much fun and, and mouth watering, and now I'm ready to go get some. And I'm yeah. starving. Go, go get some. Uh, get some lunch, everyone. Thank you all for joining yeah. us. Mm -hmm. Really, really great. Well, to uh, anyone who's interested, uh, do check out uh, Amy and Eric's book, A History of Connecticut Food: A Proud Tradition of Puddings, Clam Cakes, and Steamed Cheeseburgers, which you can find on Amazon uh, uh, on both physical copy and Kindle, and, or even better, through your local bookstore. And uh, on that note, I have some really exciting, uh, a really exciting announcement to make, and it is our Connecticut's old state house call for recipes. 
Uh, the staff at the old state house is spreading holiday cheer and making memories through the collection, th uh, through the creation of a digital cookbook of family recipes. And we would love to learn what dishes are part of your holiday traditions. Uh, the recipes can be appetizers, desserts, cocktails, entrees, snacks, anything you like. And uh, we'll be sharing these recipes on social media and then releasing a digital cookbook for free on January. And uh, we've been really missing our visitors this year, especially now in the holiday season. So this is our way of just making sure we're still part of your celebration. So uh, you can submit uh, your recipes to Samantha Gorski at cga.cc.gov from right now all the way through December the 30th. We hope to uh, get to see what, what really uh, is important, what dishes are really important to you and your families. Uh, so before we sign off, I just wanted to let you know some of our upcoming programs, uh, our 2021 programs, I should say. <laughs> so on January 20th, 2021, uh, we have our first conversations at noon, preparing for Hart Hartford's 400th birthday, which will be in 2035. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with Jackie Mandike, who's the executive director of the iQuilt Partnership for a lively conversation of how the Hartford 400 pot project looks to create a more sustainable, prosperous, equitable, mobile, and vibrant Hartford. And on Tuesday, January the 26th, uh, we have another conversation at noon, leaving the state legislature. And we'll be joined by four retiring uh, legislat legislators, a uh, speaker of the House, Representative Joe uh, Ar Arasimowitz, sorry, <laughs> leader of the Senate Republican Caucus, Senator Lam Fasano, uh, Representative Gail Laviel, and Representative uh, Russ Morin for a reflection on their years in the Connecticut General Assembly. And uh, yeah, so I hope uh, everybody had a really good time with this program. We certainly did. Uh, I was so interested and fun. Uh, and yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Amy, Eric, again, thank you for joining us today. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and a happy holiday.